Hello, and here we are again with Equine Science Talk, understanding equine science. Our aim is to make equine science understandable and therefore useful for everyone. Today, we are discussing the herd structure and the myths surrounding so-called lead mares and stallions. Let's start with the social organisation. In the natural environment, horses usually live in large herds of around 200 to 400 individuals. However, they are not all connected to each other, but rather divided into smaller groups. The herd simply means that these groups share a common territory and sometimes exchange group members. Among the groups, we distinguish between so-called harems and bachelor bands. A harem consists of between one and five stallions with their mares and foals and can have up to 35 horses. A bachelor band is composed exclusively of stallions. These can have up to 17 members and include males of all ages. Another concept here is the so-called Fission Fusion Society – this means that there is a certain amount of coming and going between the groups and it's been estimated that around 15% of the members of a group change in any one year. These fluctuations can be the result of a shortage of resources such as grazing and water or excessive insect burden or as a result of social interactions, for example, when sexually mature youngsters are driven out of the harem by the stallion, or when old mares lose their connection to the group, or when younger stallions usurp older stallions and take over their mares. Of course, this isn't a chaotic process. There is a hierarchy both within the group and between the groups, and this hierarchy is established through so-called rank dominance behaviour. Isabel will be talking about that in detail a little later. But basically, the rank of an individual usually depends on its age and how long it has been in the group. It's also important to note that the alpha, or highest ranking stallion, is not necessarily the highest ranking horse in the group, and if the alpha is middle ranking, it will sometimes join up with the other stallions in a sort of alliance to protect their mares from stallions from other groups. Now, horses move around a lot, and that raises the question of how this is coordinated, or rather, what initiates a group movement. On the one hand, if one or a few individuals separate themselves from the group, the rest of the group then decides whether to follow or not. Alternatively, movement can be initiated through driving or herding behaviour by the stallion. If the stallion senses a threat, he drives his mares together and away from the danger. There are often misunderstandings about the role of the stallion. He drives the mares together and protects them, but does not lead the group away, as is suggested by the term leader of the group. We should also here address the myth regarding lead mares. It's not the case that there is one mare who moves and everyone follows. In fact, any horse can leave the group and be followed, so initiating movement of the group. However, higher ranking mares are followed more often than lower ranking horses, as you can see from the chart, and this is called distributed leadership. Now let's look at the different types of hierarchy. Over to you, Constanza. The hierarchy can take different forms in different types of groups. As with many other mammals, when there is a small group of up to about eight animals, the hierarchy is usually linear. That means A is dominant over B, B is dominant over C, and C over D, and so on. That means horse A is the highest ranking and carries the most responsibility. But it also has the advantage that it has priority when it comes to food, water and sleeping space, and so can monopolize these resources. The horse in the lowest ranking position can avoid conflict, but also has to give way to the higher ranking horses when it comes to sharing food, water and sleeping places. This doesn't necessarily mean that the lowest ranking horse suffers by having this position. 
it can be a very clever strategy. As long as there are enough resources, it gets everything it needs, but doesn't have to get involved in conflict. Things look a bit different for the middle ranking horse B and C. They are constantly under pressure from above and they pass this pressure onto the horses below them. Sometimes these horses are more stressed than the lowest ranking ones. The linear hierarchy can become less rigid, for example in the case of pair bonds, that is to say social bonds between individual horses in the group. In these instances, horses share their rights and responsibilities, so they might eat and sleep together. But they also have to invest in their social bonds. This diagram shows a bond between two roughly equally ranking horses, but it is also entirely possible for a social bond to arise between horses with widely different ranks. So a bond could develop between horse A and horse D. It gets more complicated. In some groups, they are so-called triadic relationships, as shown in this diagram with three horses of roughly equal rank. And these three would generally share food, water and sleeping places. And it gets even more complicated in terms of maintaining these relationships and that these three must also invest in their shared bonds. Again, it is entirely possible that three of horses of very different rank can form these triadic relationships. As groups get bigger, eventually they split. As you can see in the diagram here, this group had become so big that two subgroups formed, let's say two harem groups. The higher ranking group dominates over the lower ranking group and takes priority when it comes to resources such as food and water and the lower ranking group has to give way. Individual horses may still switch between these groups. As Laureen mentioned earlier, around 15% of the group members are switches and may move between the two groups. The stallions in each of these groups usually take a pretty dim view of this. In the photo, you can see a stallion driving a switcher away from this group. When talking about bonded groups, we could talk about friendships, comparable with those of humans, but that would be rather anthropomorphic, so instead we talk about a socially bonded group, or preferred social partners. Within such groups we see socio-positive behaviours, such as mutual grooming, and there are particular advantages for members of these groups, such as higher breeding success rates and the sharing of babysitting, that's to say, looking out for the foals of the group members. Together they may control more or better resources, such as food, water and shelter, and mutual grooming can reduce stress levels. In fact, scientific studies have shown that mutual grooming lowers the heart rate and the levels of stress hormones. Horses of all ages have preferred social groups or partners, and studies on semi-wild horses have shown that most horses have between one and three preferred social partners throughout their whole lives. This seems at first to be relatively few, but when we look at the cost-benefit balance, we can see why this is the case. There's an investment to be made for each preferred partner, and the relationship with the preferred partner has to be protected from the other members of the group. We go into more detail in that in another video. Within the bonded groups, we see a great deal of socio-positive or affiliative behaviours that reduce the distance between the individuals, promote their bonds and reduce the level of aggression. These behaviours include friendly approaches. We can see an example in the picture, in which the horse with the blaze approaches the darker horse with its ears gently pricked, or, as we can see with these horses, a friendly greeting. This may develop into play behaviour with them running together, or grazing and just hanging out together, or into sleeping and resting, or mutual grooming. On the other hand, there are also socio-negative or agonistic behaviours. These have the goal of increasing the space between the individuals, and arise as individuals defend themselves or their resources. These agonistic behaviours include threats, as we can see in these photos. In the photo on the left, the horse in the foreground has its ears pinned back as it defends its place at the water, while in the photo on the right, the grey mare is defending her foal by threatening the dun horse. There are also bites and threats to bite, as you can see here, and kicks and threats to kick. We also see defence and retreat, so-called avoidance behaviours. Here, the dun mare is retreating from the bay mare, who's coming up behind her. It's a behaviour that can be difficult to recognise because it's quite subtle and is just shown with a facial expression. Usually the ears are out to the side and the neck lowered, and observations of these types of negative behaviours are used in the analysis of the hierarchy. 
That's all for now. Don't forget to subscribe to Equine Science Talk by clicking the link and check out the other topics on the channel. We'll be back soon. See you then. Thank you.